but I'm not on the, okay, there I am. It looks like me, I can tell it's me, because when I speak, my mouth moves. <laughs> okay, so um, where, where we are is uh, we've just seen that the dimension basically tells us how many new pieces we see at higher magnification. And we've seen that there are a couple, oh, this is awful. There are a couple of different uh, types of dimension. Uh, we've been looking first at fractal dimension, which is the space filling properties. And next, or right now, we're going to look at the topological dimension. So let's look at the topological dimension, which is over here, um, not quite over there. Hey, we're not going to look at that next. Okay, let's, uh, let's look at this next. We're going to get to the topological dimension shortly. Shortly. Okay. Um, first, what we're going to do is we're going to look at examples of the fractal dimension and see how to compute it, because it's the measure of the information in the system, and so we're going to see how to compute it. And this shows an example of the Koch curve from uh, Helga von Koch, who I think was... Austrian, but I'm not sure. Um, and the way this is constructed is we start with an equilateral triangle, three units on a side, one, two, three. And then we replace each line segment by a line segment, a little triangle, and another line segment. So at each stage in this construction, um, you can see that the length of each side goes from one, two, three, to one, two, three, four units. So it gets bigger. So we uh, now put these things here. And now we take each one of these segments and redo the whole process. And so we get this and we get that. And if you think about what the perimeter of this object is happening, at each point, if the initial perimeter was 3 times 3 was 9, then the next time, the at the next stage of the construction, it's 4 thirds times 9. And the next case, it's 4 thirds times the previous one, which is 4 thirds times 9. And the next time, it's going to be 4 thirds times 4 thirds times 4 thirds times 9. And as we go further and further, this is the usual blah, 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 then, and we get, uh, eventually, we're going to get 4 thirds times 4 thirds uh, times 4 thirds an infinite number of times. And that's a very big number. So because each one of these is greater than 1, we keep multiplying, we get a very big number. And uh, so that means that the perimeter of this thing is infinite. So it's very long on the side, infinite. And how do we calculate the dimension? Well, at each stage in the process, uh, we're going from one line segment. We're replacing it by one, two, three, four pieces. So the resolution is, in essence, changing by a factor of three. See, this resolution allows us to see this piece. And this resolution allows us to see this piece. So in order to see this piece, we have to go down and scale factor of 3. So you see 1, 2, 3. So we're changing the resolution by a factor of 3. And when we change the resolution by a factor of 3, we see 1, 2, 3, 4 pieces. And so the dimension is the log of the number of new pieces divided by the log of the factor of the finer resolution. Remember, that's that m. See, we're cutting the m now. Um, the m is really down. No, let's not say it that way. It's the log of the number of new pieces divided by the log of the change in resolution, which is log 4 over log 3. So the perimeter of the Koch curve is 1.269. So you notice that the perimeter of this thing is, do you want me to leave that on for a second? You're welcome. Remember, I can do two but not three things at a time. So I can speak and push buttons. But if I started to write, either I would push the wrong button or I'd write the wrong thing. Or I'd say the wrong thing. See, but saying just speaking, not doing anything else, I can speak, you know. OK. So um, the, 
Um, except I forgot what I was going to say. Um, OK. The perimeter of this Koch curve, which is very wiggly, is very wiggly. This dimension is, is about 1.26. So if the dimension was 1, it would be like a regular line and would have a finite length. If it was really wiggly, if it was this wiggly, see, it would cover an area and have dimension 2 and would be an area. And its dimension is kind of in between uh, that of a line and that of an area. So it's more wiggly and longer than a line, but not so wiggly that it covers an area. So that's what it means to have dimension in between 1 and 2. So it's, it's wigglier than a line, than a 1D line, and also infinitely long. But it's not so wiggly that it covers an area. So that's kind of the interpretation of what this dimension of 1.26 means. Now, we can determine fractal dimensions in, a, in another way. All these colors are different. Like this is, as I said this before, this is actually red on my screen and blue on your screens. Um, I should check to see if the spelling is the same on both screens. But uh, um, we can now look at the fractal dimension by another method, which is called box counting. And let me describe a little bit what box counting is. So we'll go back here. Um, so this is called box counting. And this is really an example counting, an example of capacity. So it's one, one subcategory under capacity. Remember, in capacity, we have this object. And we cover it with these balls. And we use enough of them to create a minimal covering to cover an object. Well, we can choose balls of a very particular type. We can choose the balls or the sets that are involved in the covering. Um, these are really in the more generalized sets, as in the hostel fesikovich dimension. We, we can choose these to be boxes in an orthogonal coordinate grid. So for example, in two dimensions, we can have each box in this coordinate grid represent one of those sets of one of the balls in the counting. So then if we have an object that um, covers, if this, is, if this is the object, we can ask how many boxes are needed to cover the object. And the answer here is this one, two, three, four, five, six. So six boxes here contain the object. Then what we can do is we can change the box size. So we can make the box size smaller, for example, and have the same object. This is the same object. And we could find out how many of the smaller boxes cover the same object. And in this case, it's exactly 24 boxes. So we can see how the uh, number of boxes needed to cover the objects changes with the size of the boxes. And then what we're going to do is we're going to plot the logarithm of the number of boxes against the given, of a given size against the logarithm. I better keep this off in case someone starts to count. Um, and we're going to then get a line here. And the slope of this line will be the dimension, or minus the slope will be the fractal dimension. Um, so this is a way of implementing capacity. It's a very simple way. And it's a very useful way. And a number of people, including me, have developed fast algorithms to count the number of boxes. And maybe I'll talk about, I didn't bring transparency to so the algorithms. So maybe I'll talk about it. Maybe I won't. Um, this shows a specific example. Uh, this is a set. If we cover it with this largest box, uh, so the scale is 1. We'll assume this is one unit on a side. You can see one box covers the whole object. If I go to boxes that are one half the size, we can see that three boxes cover the same object. If we go to one quarter, now it will take 11 boxes to cover the same object. 
And if we go to 1 8th, in this case, it takes 26 boxes to cover the same object. And now if we make a plot of this, um, in this case, it's log of r versus log of n of r. And we have the boxes here. The slope here, uh, in this case, is uh, minus 1.6. And so the fractal dimension uh, is minus the slope, minus the slope of log of n of r of r. So that's 1.6. Uh, and so this gives us the fractal dimension. Now, there are a number of people, including myself, who developed uh, fast algorithms in order to uh, actually evaluate the dimension. And let me, let me talk about uh, the algorithms um, that we use to do this, just in a general sense, not that they're so useful in this case, although they're quite useful, but uh, as a general principle about how you approach problems, I think there are two interesting lessons here. So let me talk about those two interesting lessons. Um, so, I've mentioned a number of times is that given a hard problem to solve, uh, you don't solve it. You make it into an easier problem, an equivalent easier problem, and then solve the easier problem. And in terms of box counting, we did this in a number of, in really in three different, the three different aspects that I did. And a number of other people developed this at roughly the same time, independently. And I wasn't going to publish this initially because it seemed obvious to me, but one of the people I met said it wasn't obvious, so we published it. And apparently it wasn't obvious to everybody. Um, first thing here is that, just to repeat a number of times, the mathematics says you need to take the limits as epsilon goes to zero. But as you just see on this thing, we don't need to take any limits. We can get the value of d from the slope. So we don't need to take the limit. Uh, we can just look at the slope of log n of r versus log r. And, and this wasn't obvious, at least in the literature and the articles that people have published. So we don't need to take the slope. If getting the limit is hard, Instead of getting the limit, we do something else. We look at the slope. So this is a nice part of this general principle. If the hard thing is hard to do, we do something that's equivalent but easy to do. The second thing, one of the reasons why the box counting was hard is that when the boxes get small, so when the boxes are small, typically um, there are many boxes And most of the boxes are empty because the set, the data, is only in some of the boxes. So if we look at each box to see whether there's data in it, it takes a very long time and the algorithm is slow. So the answer is we don't look at the empty boxes. What we do is look at the data and then see how many different boxes the data is in. So we only count the data, the number of data points, which will usually be less than the number of boxes when the boxes are small. So this is, doesn't sound like it's a big change. What you can have, as Carl Sagan used to say, billions and billions of boxes here and only like 1,000 data points. So if you're looking at all the boxes, it's a very slow procedure. So we look at the data. And the next part of this is how do we go about doing that? And this is the part that's a little bit clever. So this is one of the clever parts of this. Although all these different parts are clever, actually. Um, and this is based, let me tell you where the cleverness comes from. Uh, it comes from some aspects of things that are done in computers, and also some aspects of um, how this guy, George Cantor, uh, did things with infinities. But, but the point is that this stuff, the cleverness, comes from somewhere else. So if you know lots of stuff, it helps you do lots of different things. That is, you can apply this stuff in ways that are useful, but it helps to know lots of stuff to get ideas on how to do the application. And in particular, there are a couple of different ways to describe what, what I and the other people here did. Um, one way to describe it in terms of what Cantor did is to say we can map any 
n-dimensional space onto a line. Because it turns out, and what Cantor proved, is that an n-dimensional space has the same order of infinities as a single line. In terms of computers, the same thing is called a hashing. And I'll describe it more in terms of computers. If you're familiar with Cantor's mapping, then this will be obvious. But I'll describe it in what's called a hashing. And what a hashing means in computers is that somehow we use the properties of an object to generate a number that we can then operate on or use in some way. And, and I'll give an example. And I think this is how spelling checkers work, but I'm not sure. Okay. Um, let's say I have a word like, this is a good word, help. And I want to see if this word is spelled correctly. Okay. Now, there are lots of different ways to see if this word is spelled correctly. But uh, what I might do is make each of one of these an alphanumeric symbol and then look that up in some huge table to see if these alphanumeric symbols you know, occur in that table. That's very inefficient. Looking things up in a big dictionary, even for computers, is very inefficient. So you can do something much trickier. Each of these letters has an ASCII equivalent. That is, it's represented by a number in some schemes, by the American Standard Code for something, something. Information interchange. OK. And are you guessing, or is that really the? OK, something like that. So I can translate. I don't remember what the numbers are, but maybe H is 13, and E is 2, and L is 15, and P is 20. So I can actually create a number, this number, 13215 Now, if I have a dictionary that consists of an equivalent translation of all the other legitimate words uh, in, in order, it's, very, it's much easier for me to find if this number is in the dictionary. And that's actually how spelling checkers actually work. So what we did in the box counting is, is a variant of this which is that, let's say we have boxes, and I can represent these as 1 and zeros. M maybe if I do it in the usual ordering, where the lower numbers come first. So I could represent anything in this box by 0, 0, in this box by 0, 1, here by 1, 1, uh, 1, 0. So depending where a point falls, I can represent it by strings of 1 and zeros. So in order to count data points and not boxes, what I do is add, let's say, the x and y coordinates together, let's say, for this, uh, the scheme that's here with these four boxes. And, and let's say there were two, three data points. If the three data points had coordinates that fell in this, in two in this box, I would get 1, 0, 1, 0, and one in the other box would be like that. So now the problem is not looking at all the boxes. I don't need to look at these two boxes. I'm just looking at the three data points. And then if I can see how many data points have different numbers, will tell me how many different boxes are occupied. This here, this isn't a huge saving because we have three points and four data boxes. But if we had three points and 10 billion data boxes, then we'd saved a lot of time doing it this way. So the next question is, how do I tell how many of these numbers are different? And all four of us thought of basically the same trick each time, which is we sort these numbers in order and then walk down the list and see when the numbers change. And the way we do boxes of different size, if the coordinates are really like binary coordinates of this for a box, for example, for the x coordinate, if we're only interested in the biggest box, we take the first digit. The next digit's box, we take the next two, the next smallest box, the next smallest box, the three, et cetera. And that refines the box size. What we actually do is we do an, a logical AND with a mask that picks out the right zeros. Is this clear? Should I say this again? Any more words on this? The, the basic point I'm trying to give you is that you can use different ideas from computer science and mathematics to change the problem. And in this case, I've changed the problem so that we, we deal, we in essence give a number that represents, that will be the same if the points are in the same box. And that the number of digits in that number will be the size of the box. 
and we can find out how many are in, are in, this, are in different boxes by ordering them and then running down the list. So this is just to say that there are algorithms that may not be obvious at the beginning, but if you use these principles of given a hard problem, you think what, what you really want to do with the problem, then you solve the problem in a different way. If there are a lot of boxes, maybe you want to look at data points, and you think in this case of a clever way of asking how many things are in the same box. In this way, you confuse the name of something with where something is. In fact, this is one of the deepest underlying principles by which computers work. Because computers use numbers to identify memory locations, but then the computers can operate on those numbers. So the things that the computers use are the things that they can operate on. And this is one of the central ideas from von Neumann on computing machines. So this is kind of related to that, that we can always represent things by numbers in a way that we can operate on the numbers. So this is sort of a sub-application um, of the general principle of which computers work. So understanding all this crap gives you additional games to play in doing algorithms and finding faster ways to do things. And it's always the right way to do things. The right way is not to change everything from, in from floating point to integer to speed everything up by a factor of two, because computers do faster integer than floating point. The right way is to sit down and think, what entirely different way can I do this problem? And as I said, about five of us. And the difference in time was this used to take two hours to do on a fax. And with this algorithm, it takes like two minutes to do on an old type Mac. So, so this, was a tr this is a change in speed of hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of times for evaluating data sets. Typical data sets, this is a gain of a factor of about 1,000. For bigger data sets, this would be a gain of a factor of 10,000 in time. So we're talking about huge factors of improvement in time by, by doing it this way. Um, so let's see what comes up next on the machine. Next on the machine is the most common way, which I can see and you will see shortly, uh, the next is the most common way of getting the fractal dimension. In, it's interesting that this is the most common way, because this is not the way mathematicians do fractal dimensions, usually. And it shows that in evaluating data, that how we handle real data is not necessarily exactly the mathematical definitions, may be related to them, and certainly it's derived from them, but it's a different procedure. And I'm going to call this the scaling method. So we see how something scales, and that gives us the fractal dimension. And uh, I get to reboot the machine. Yeah, yeah, I know. So while the machine is uh, checking its memory, um, and uh, Billy is recalculating whatever it needs to run NT. Um, the way this works, we've seen that some measurement depends or is proportional to the resolution or the amount of data. And we've also seen that the fractal dimension depends on the resolution. So by relating these two, we can get the dimension. Now typically what, what happens is some measurement depends on
typically what happens is some measurement depends on some function which depends on the number of pieces and also depends on the size of the pieces and also some function that depends on the size of the pieces. So what we do is we put in these two functions, which will be different for each physical measurement, and from that we'll be able to calculate the fractal dimension. So this is the most common use procedure, is really from the scaling properties, not from uh, the hustoff bezikovich dimension will be related to how the dimension um, depends on the size of the pieces, but it will come into play and be evaluated um, through this relationship. So this is the mathematical end of dimension put in here, but how we'll evaluate it from the dimension depends on this, uh, this scaling. Uh, so for example, the typical example is, uh, a good example is length. Length depends on the number of pieces of a given size and the length of each piece. So for example, if I have a curve, I have one, two, three, four pieces. One, two, three, four pieces in this curve. Um, and what's the length? The length is the four pieces times the size of each piece. And since each piece is one inch, this curve is four inches long. So the length is the number of pieces times the size of each piece. And how the number of pieces depend on dimension? We said the number of pieces is like the r to the minus d. So this means that the length goes like r to the minus d times r, which, which is r to the 1 minus d. So if we actually measure how the scaling depends on resolution, if we measure that the resolution is like r to the alpha, where we get this from the data from the experiment, then we could see that this alpha is equal to 1 minus d, and from that we compute the d. And that's what the slide is going to show. As soon as the pen stop, I'll switch to the slide so you can write down exactly the same thing which is on the slide. It's a good thing I can't cut the music or anything else while we're doing this. Okay? If you draw little pictures of other things, I can't tell if you're writing or not. That's not fair. Uh, so this is, this is just what I said here, that um, from the scaling relationship, we can determine the fractal dimension. So for example, the dimension n is the number of pieces found at resolution r. Typically, n is a function of r is proportional to r to the minus d. Some property of the system that we measure experimentally, q, is proportional to r to the minus b. And so the property that we measure usually depends on some power, some function, in this case a power, the number of pieces times the size of each piece. So relating these to this, we get that the dimension we can write in terms of those other two um, uh, variables. So we can get the dimension uh, from how we do the measurement of a property. This looks confusing. I've always tried to simplify this in different ways, and there's no simple, simpler way to do it. We're measuring uh, the B from the data. We know alpha and beta from the theory, and so uh, we can get D in terms of alpha and beta from the theory and the B that we measure from the, from the data. I don't like that hourglass up there. I don't know what it's been doing. Okay, so, and, and this, the next one just shows the example I was telling you, and this is how Richardson measured the coastline of Britain. Uh, we know that the number of um, pieces at size r goes like r to the minus d. Uh, Richardson found that uh, the length of the coastline is proportional to r raised to the minus one quarter. One quarter. So since the uh, length should depend on the number of pieces times r, that's r to the 1 minus d, as I just showed you on the other the Elmo. Uh, if I relate 1 minus d to minus 1 quarter, then I get the fact that the length of the coastline is 1 and a quarter. 
And this sort of procedure of doing evaluating the dimension from the fract from the scaling is the most common way dimensions are determined from experimental data. So it's from the scaling relationship, not directly from the Hostoff-Vesikovich or capacity or anything else. But we can see that we've used this, this crucial relationship, which comes from the capacity in the Hostoff-Vesikovich dimension and the self-similarity dimension, in order to uh, to get this property. So now we finish with the fractal dimension. We're going to do a different dimension, the topological dimension. So it's important enough for me to write down that um, the fractal dimension remember, is the space filling properties of an object. And it can be an integer or not. You know, like 1 or 2 or 23.1 or 0.3. So it doesn't have to be an integer. And the next dimension we're going to look at now is the topological dimension. And this says how pieces in the object are connected. And we'll see this is always an integer. Because it's just how it's defined. And I'm going to give some examples of topological dimension. And most books don't describe the topological dimension. One of the things we did in both of my books is we described both the fractal and topological dimensions. And we're going to see the reason for doing this is using these two concepts, so I'm going to give you a formal definition of a fractal. But we need both of these concepts to do it. And um, so that's why we're, going to, we're, we're, we're doing this. So. Uh, the, I'll give two explanations of the, fra of, the of the topological dimension. The first one is called the covering dimension. So we're back to doing one of these minimal coverings. We have these sets, um, and uh, we cover our object with these sets. And when we cover our object, each point of the object is going to be in more than one set. Because as you can see here, the circles need to overlap to cover the whole object. So if the object is this plane, then this point in the plane, in this case, is in one, two, three sets. And we look at a minimal covering again. And if each point in the object, our plane, is covered by no more than G sets, then the covering dimension is G minus 1. You can see this looks like real mathematics, right? This is uh, measure theory and topology. So, um, you know, this, you know, it has a real mathematical flavor to it. Um, and uh, the example I've given here is for a plane. And the plane G equals 3. In a minimal covering, no point in the set is in more than three circles. And it looks like some of them here are, but I guess that's, this is not a minimal covering. So I think there are some intersections here which look kind of like 4. Um, maybe I got rid of all of them. The, no point here is in more than three sets. So since no point is in more than 3, then the dimension of a plane, topological dimension, is 3 minus 1 equals 2. So you can see that the plane has the same fractal dimension as its topological dimension. So this, this topological dimension, again, intuitively recovers 1, 2, and 3 for lines, areas, and volumes. So it's consistent with what our intuition is for those structures. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the answer, yeah, yeah. Th to repeat for the tape, if it wasn't clear, the question is, surely the number of sets that are involved in that covering um, that will cover each point depends how the sets are arranged in the diagram. And the answer is they must be arranged so that they form a minimal covering, that is, the smallest number of sets. In this case, since we're using balls, okay, that is these circles, on a two-dimensional uh, plane, balls are circles, 
uh, the covering here of all the points in the plane must, must be by the smallest number of circles. It must be a minimal covering. And I'm, uh, I'm not going to, or probably capable of giving you, a constructive definition or constructive procedure of how we go about doing that. I'm just saying that when that's done, no point will be in more than three. And if you think of doing a covering where one point is more than four, then if we shift all the circles around, we can cover it in fewer circles. So uh, we have to show how, why this is a minimal covering. And that makes implementing this a little trickier. And, and I'm not going to discuss the implementation, which I don't fully understand. But I understand the definition. In this case, um, because we're dealing in a two-dimensional area, the simplest covering would be a circle, because it's a ball. A ball is actually, it's formally in the open set. It's all the points less, with less than a certain distance from a given point. And the, the simplest set we can do this covering with would be balls. A more complicated set would be sets of arbitrary size and shape that are convex, that is, that don't have sort of holes in them and don't have um, sort of uh, valleys that can cause problems, uh, where then we have sets of different sizes, but we define the diameter of the sets as the largest distance between points in the set. And we can do this covering in terms of sets like that. That's how the hostoff vesikovic's dimension is determined. But for here, we're using the simplest equal sized, equally shaped sets, which in this case would be circles. And in general would be balls for a space that's not two dimensional. And balls on a one dimensional line are line segments, or, or lines, straight lines. And balls in four dimensions are harder to picture. But balls go up to infinite dimensions, or at least large, finite dimensions. Okay, this is one, one way to define the covering dimension. Another way is shown here. This is sort of an interesting way to do it. We know that the borders of a d-dimensional space have dimension d minus 1. That is, in this room, if you can flip to the camera for a moment. Can you maybe flip to the camera for a moment? You can bang on the, is anyone there? There's someone there. There's a head. Usually heads are associated with, uh, <laughs> but maybe not. Okay, it doesn't matter. Um, in this, all I'm going to do is go like this. In this three-dimensional three room, okay, the borders of this three-dimensional room are six-dimensional planes. One, two, three, four, five, six. So the borders of this three-dimensional space are two-dimensional planes. The borders of each of these two-dimensional planes, if we look at this one, are one, two, three, four one-dimensional lines, OK? So um, in general, when we have, if you go back to the Elmo, thanks. Um, if we have any space, as I said, what we, oops, what we have here, uh, if we're covering a plane, one, two, three, four, dimensional line. So any d-dimensional space is bordered by d minus 1 dimensional structures. So the idea here is that what we do is we look at the borders of the space, and then we find the borders of the borders, and then the borders of the borders. And we keep going down until we get a point. And how many times we have to do this tells us what the dimensionality of the space was before we started this iterative process. And that's why this is called the iterative dimension. So for example, here, uh, let's say we're back to our plane again. If we look at the borders of the plane, uh, the dimension of the borders is uh, these one-dimensional lines. And again, if we wanted to isolate a point on a one-dimensional line, we can isolate it by two, two points on either side. Um, so that's the last step. And so we have to do step one and step two to get to this step. So therefore, the dimensionality of a plane is two. So this is the iterative dimension. The iterative dimension and this covering dimension should always lead to the same answer. You can see that they're both going to be integers. You can see this one is going to be an integer because it's a, we have to repeat this a finite number of times. You can see this one is going to be an integer because we're asking the numbers of sets so it's not like one and a third sets can cover something. It's either one or two. 
or three or four or five or whatever. So that's why both of these, di these uh, dimensions will lead to integers. So now let's see what comes up next on the machine is the embedding dimension. So this is our last dimension. And the embedding dimension is the dimension that the fractal lives in. So fractals can live inside integer dimensional spaces. For example, we might have a line actually with uh, uh, this line might, for example, be um, deoxynucleic ribonucleic acid. So it could be DNA. And it could be that this is an enzyme sliding along causing a chemical reaction um, on, the en on the DNA. So we can have one dimensional uh, motion of an enzyme who lives on the DNA can only move in one dimensional space. Or we might have a two dimensional space or a three dimensional space where we have chemical reactions. We might have chemical reactions happening only on the surface of a material or within a container. So we can certainly have embedding dimensions that are integers, one, two, and three, and we can also have embedding dimensions that are not integers, that live in some fractal. Now, I was saying before, we can actually make something out of silicon where these um, species can only walk in certain places, and so they can react with each other when they react, but they are restricted to uh, a fractal itself. So the embedding dimension where a fractal lives can either be, as in this case, a non-integer dimension, or in this case, an integer dimension. So now the next one should be what I'm hoping it is, and it is. This is the definition of a fractal. So now after speaking for about six hours, I'm going to tell you what a fractal is. Not today, I mean over just, it seemed like six hours today, but it's not. So. Um, this is the definition of a fractal. I'm going to make it a little bit broader than this. But what it says, um, and I'll, I'll write it down on the piece of paper. This is the same thing. Basically, this is the definition that Mandelbrot gives of a fractal. He says, a set defined on a metric space is a fractal if and only if, that just means it's a definition, its fractal dimension is greater than the topological dimension. If there's some cases where these two are equal, we still like to call these a fractal. But for the moment, we'll stick with the greater than. And I would expand this definition to say not only a set, but any data or time series of values that has the same statistical properties implied by the fractal dimension being greater than the topological dimension. So I would expand the definition from just objects to data or time series of data or values that have the same statistical properties that this would imply for the object. Now I can say this in a, in a qualitative way. I'll say lots of this in a qualitative way, but to, to enhance on the last piece here for the moment, Basically, we can represent the object by a probability density function because we can ask how many pieces it has of a different, given size. And so for an object, we can also treat this thing in terms of its probability density function. And I'm saying any probability density function that has the same properties as the probability density function of those objects, I want to call a fractal as well. And I think that's a reasonable extension of Mandelbrot's definition. OK. Um, these fractal objects that have the property that the fractal dimension is greater than the topological dimension, okay. we can describe this object by a probability density function Remember, which is the number of pieces of a given size. Remember, as we go to finer and finer size, we see more pieces. 
So we can also describe these objects by a probability density function. And I would say now that any probability density function that has this form as if it would come from one of those objects, I would say is a fractal. And that probability density function could come from a set of numbers, from an experiment, or time series values, you know, like we're measuring something in time. Is that clear? So, so to me, the important properties are that the topology, this is really measure theory and topology, lead to probability density functions. Probability density functions, probabilities can also be defined not starting from probability, but also starting from measure theory. So let me say these now represent statistics in measure theory. Um, anything that these measure theory and topology properties that result in a PDF in terms of measure theory and statistics that has this form, I would say any PDF of this form I want to call fractal. Okay, so let's, let's go back to, so this is what that definition is. Now let me show you, um, let me give, let's use the uh, Helga's curve to um, give you a definition, an example of how this works. So uh, this is the Koch snowflake, and we're looking at the perimeter. The perimeter is characterized by the fractal dimension. The perimeter is wigglier than a one-dimensional line. It's infinitely long. If we had a circle here, the perimeter of the circle would be finite. But this is so wiggly, the perimeter is infinitely long. On the other hand, if you evaluate the topical dimension, even though the perimeter is very long, it's still a line how the surface is connected, how the edge of this is connected, is a line. It turns out it has topological dimension 1. So here we have a situation where the fractal dimension is 1.3, the topological dimension is 1. 1.3 is greater than 1. The, the um, fractal dimension is greater than the topological dimension, so therefore this thing is a fractal. That's why the perimeter of the Koch curve is a fractal. So, uh, again, the perimeter covers more space than a 1D line, but it covers less space than a 2D area. That's why its dimension is in between 1 and 2. And this gives rise to why Mandelbrot coined the word fractal. And there are two aspects of this. One, that it's fragmented, that it has many pieces. And second of all, that it has a fractal dimension. So, so let's go back to, to this again. Uh, the fragmented means that as we go to finer and finer detail, we see more pieces. And the fractional dimension is, this is a number that's uh, greater than 1. And what's not said here is that any time that the fractal dimension is greater than the topological dimension, it's as if this line is longer than it should be. It's more wiggly, it's got more pieces than it should be. It's longer than it should be. A normal line around this area would have dimension 1, but this has got a bigger dimension. It's longer than it should be. How much bigger? By what's called the co-dimension, which in this case is the difference between these two. So in this case, it's longer than dimension 1 or covers more space than dimension 1 by 0.2619, etc. So this additional amount is how much more wiggly it is than it should be. And that's why we keep finding finer pieces when we look at finer detail. Because it's bigger than it should be. It's got more pieces than it should have. So it sh it's a line. It should have dimension 1. But it's keep bigger. It's got all these additional wiggles which come from this additional component in the dimension. And that's why when we look at finer detail, we see more pieces from it. So that gives the reason why we see more and more pieces. That its dimension is bigger than kind of what we're expecting from it. So this is a formal definition of a fractal in, in what, it, what it means. And as I said, I expand the definition because I do. And, and um, um, even Mandelbrot considers time series that are fractal as well, although he gives the definition just in terms of the metric space. 
And this is the way things work, right? You can pick on something and you can change it a little bit. You can make it more restrictive or less restrictive. It depends how useful that is. And in this case, it's very useful because we can use it to analyze a lot of biological data we couldn't use otherwise. So it's, it's a useful thing to do. So now I'm going to show you some examples of how we can use it. Um, this is using it as a way to characterize, in this case, uh, data uh, from rats. So these are rats that live in Boston, or used to live in Boston. And um, they, uh, some of them grow up uh, under normal conditions of oxygen. And some of them live in a box which has higher than usual oxygen or lower than usual oxygen. Okay. And um, which leads me to a number of thoughts, which none of which I'll pursue. Um, but um, their lungs develop in an unusual way. Uh, this shows the lung from a rat that um, was living under normal oxygen levels. And um, um, after the rat died, a radio-opaque material was inserted into the arteries of the lungs, and then an x-ray was taken. And there are conditions in people where they have high blood pressure in the lungs, that is, pulmonary hypertension. And uh, one of the reasons that this may occur is that their lungs may develop under a normal circumstances, and these experiments were done to test that. Now, here the fractal dimension was determined by box counting. In fact, it was determined by me. Uh, so first of all, I processed this data by using a high-pass contrast-enhancing filter, uh, which is better known as a Xerox machine. So what I did is I took the x-rays and I Xeroxed them. And that increased the contrast in the x-rays. And then I used an old device on an Apple printer called ThunderScan, which replaced the head of a printer with a sensor that scanned lines across, used the printer to scan across the piece of paper. And from that, I digitized the image. And actually, this is a printout of that image. Dig digitized the image. And then I used my box counting algorithm to um, uh, produce this image. Uh, first of all, I had, now that I digitized the image, I had to somehow produce the xy coordinates of all these points uh, into the computer. And I did that by using a real slob trick, which is a very efficient way of doing this, which I have a program, which is in BASIC, that does this. Um, but uh, what I did is I pasted this image to the computer screen. I should make a noise at this point, but I can't make good noises and don't know what the appropriate noise would be, but it'll be so I, I paste the computer screen. And now I have the basic program looks at each pixel on the computer screen. If it finds a black pixel, it writes the coordinate number of that pixel in x and y to, a, to the comp program that it saves on the disk. So this means that any a a object acquired in any way that I can paste to the screen, I can take the numbers of the pixels. So it's crude because we're just doing the resolution on the screen. But it's very easy and basic to write a program to interrogate the screen and find out if there's a black or a white pixel on the screen. So this is a very nice way of creating a data set from any image. So the image was digitized, then read off the screen by this program, and then the box counting program determined its dimension, which in this case was 1.65. Then we compared this dimension to that on rats that were raised at low oxygen or high oxygen. In fact, both of these have deleterious effects on the branching. You can see that both the, the high oxygen and the low oxygen has cut out higher order branching compared to the normal one shown here. So this has lots of finer branches, but this one and this one don't have finer branches. And you can see this one has a dimension of 1.43, this one 1.53, and the normal 1.65. So here, the, the fractal dimension was a way of describing the differences in the branching in the pulmonary arteries of these different rats. Now, this is not the only way to describe this. As you can see here, there are a lot more arteries in the normal than there are in the rats that are abnormal. So we could just as well equally describe these change, not just as well, we could describe differences in these three animals by the average density of the vessels as well as the fractal dimension. 
Now, whether the fractal dimension sheds something additionally that's useful on this or not is not clear, but at least it's measuring something different. So here, there's a measure of these three things which would be different just in terms of the average density, where the fractal dimension measures something different in terms of how many finer branches they have, and maybe that's a different way of characterizing the branching and might, might be useful. So that's one example of the fractal dimension. Uh, another example where it's been used are in surfaces of organs or of uh, molecules in terms of the surface of the cell membranes, as we've seen before. Uh, bacterial colonies don't grow with a smooth edge. Um, they grow with a ruffled edge. So if I have bacteria growing in a dish, this is a dish, there's a ruffled edge. That represents diffusion of nutrients and wastes out of the bacterial colony. And there's a fractal dimension of this edge. Uh, in the cell membrane, the cell membrane consists of lipids. So on edge, the cell membrane has hydrophobic, hydrophilic water-loving pieces and then water-hating pieces that stick out here. And so those oily pieces like to be together like an oil drop. So the membrane of the cell, this lipid membrane, forms things like this. And then the water, which is, should be, of course, blue, is on the outside. So these round pieces, phospholipid head groups, like to be in the water. But these hydrocarbon chains are oily, don't like to be in water. So it forms a, by itself a membrane like this. Now, in a cell, starting to wake up, so I'm thinking of things like cells with bars and other stuff. Um, okay. um, in a cell, if I make it three-dimensional, there are more than one type of lipid. And you might think that the lipid types are distributed evenly over cells, but in fact they're not. We have regimes which have actually fractal branching patterns of one type of lipid within another type of lipid. So they form branching patterns very similar to the diffusion-limited aggregations. Um, and those are distributed over the cell surface. And there's a general principle here, which is our first thought has been in the past, given if we have two things, to think that they would be evenly distributed in a uniform way, uniformly mixed. But what the fractals tell you is that a more likely guess is that we have a more fractal distribution of the areas of different size within each other, more hierarchies of areas, it's probably more likely than having things uniformly distributed. We're very biased in thinking of things uniformly distributed. So now our first guess might be something more like this rather than something like that. And that turns out to be true in many cases. So the fractals change what our first guess of what something might be, um, something might be like. Uh, other examples where the biological dimension have been measured have been in dendrites of neurons. So for example, um, a group that I'm not visiting next week in Washington has been at National Institute of Health from uh, Smith, he has been looking at nerve cells. And the nerve cells have dendrites that branch. And they've been looking at the fractal dimension as a way of categorizing uh, different uh, uh, nerve cells, so some of them are more branched than others, for example, in the retina. And this would have a fractal dimension of 1.2, and this would have a fractional dimension of 1.6. I can look at these and tell you pretty good what the fractal dimensions would be, actually. And these are pretty accurate. Um, so, uh, although we have no way of telling that, but it's not, they're not so bad, probably. Um, and, um, it turns out that in collaboration with people in uh, Gliwice in Poland and in London, um, these people have been looking actually at, retina, uh, at um, neurons in the retina and have been finding that fract different fractal dimensions have different electrophysiological firing patterns or responses to different stimuli so that there may be some functional relationship that you can pull out of the dimension that may be related to how the neurons are actually 
uh, actually working. No, we, we, we don't know how to, we, just for the tape, although I think it's on. The question is, if you, if you had two different cells, how would you tell there was a statistically significant difference? And we don't know how to do that. I don't, I don't know how to do that. Um, it's very hard to estimate what are the statistical errors in doing these dimensions. So given that, it's very hard to determine uh, how to compare two sets of numbers. What people usually do, which is completely wrong, is, uh, for example, if on some scaling plot we can evaluate the fit on this scaling plot, we'll get a dimension plus or minus some error. And then we could compare the two dimensions by using some t-test or something else. But this, this fit is only part of the process in determining the dimension and really only refers to this fit. And what the real error here is, is very difficult to determine. So you could, just given the numbers without knowing the variance, a t-test would be hard to do because you would really need an estimate of the variance. And the variance of this fitting is not really the right estimate of the variance. So you could use a non-parametric test, which is what we usually do, to compare just these values of d and those values of d. And I think that would probably be the best thing to do. And it's very hard to ascertain what's a statistically significant difference. It is usually the case that different methods give systematically different values of d for the same data. So what you really want to use, make sure is use the same method to evaluate both dimensions. And this also means it makes it difficult to compare data from different articles in the literature okay, that may have used different methods. But what you'd want to use is use the same method and probably use some non-parametric test. Um, again, people have used the variance just from the fitting of this line, but this is really an underestimate of the total variance in determining you know, what the D is. So, um, um, and we also don't know if, 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 so this is, if we had one cell and we were measuring D and comparing it to D of another cell, if we measured 15 Ds of this cell type and 15 of that cell type, formally we could do a t-test. But we don't know what the distribution of errors here, whether that's going to be Gaussian or not Gaussian. In fact, I would guess it's probably Gaussian, although I don't know that. So, so, so not knowing what the distribution of errors formally are in this procedure, you know, we could do a t-test, but it might be a little bit, we're not sure really how, how good that's going to be. So I would say it's not clear how to do things. As I say, usually people quote the formal error in these fits, and that's really an underestimate of everything. In, in um, what, what we were doing, or what I was watching these other people do, they were trying to correlate the D against some electrophysiological parameter. So in that case, they produce some sort of sc scatter plot and then try to do a fit. And there's some error, some correlation R you can use in that fit. Okay. Uh, another example are blood vessels uh, in the eye, heart, and lung. So for example, if you look into uh, your eye, and I don't think we have this in Fort Lauderdale, but it's very common by using a little spherical lens so you can look at the blood vessels in your own eye. And uh, they have this at the Exploratorium in San Francisco and some other science museums. I don't think we have it here in, in the museum in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, but basically, it's a little trick. And if you look in your eye, as I've drawn before, uh, coming out of the optic nerve, I guess it's late in the class, so blood now has become blue. Um, and we have these blood vessels which avoid the area of best vision, the fovea, and then extend over the rest of the retina. People are trying to associate different fractal dimensions here with different diseases or the uh, quantity or the progression of a disease to see if that tells you something useful uh, about what's going on here. And uh, also in terms of blood flow in the heart, uh, people have used the fractal dimension to characterize the blood flow in the heart. Um, other examples include textures of x-rays involving bone and teeth to look at uh, calcium uh, loss in older people. Uh, and for example, a texture of how radioisotopes are uh, distributed in the liver. 
Um, we heard Mal Teich talk here um, a couple weeks ago on the timing of action potentials from nerve fibers. Um, and I've talked about the opening and closing of ion channels. Uh, we're going to hear Laura talk this afternoon about the timing of inactivation, which will have fractal scaling properties. People have also looked at the vibrations in proteins having fractal properties and the concentration dependence of reaction rates of enzymes, which are misspelt there. Um, so in summary, in the fractal dimension provides us a way of giving a numerical description of self-similarity, of how a small piece uh, is related to the whole large piece. Since the small pieces are related to the large piece, it means each small piece is related to the large piece, and so the small pieces are related to each other in space or here in opening and closing an ion channel in time. So the fractal dimension tells us of the correlations between the small pieces and the large pieces, and therefore indirectly correlations between the small pieces and other small pieces. Uh, as I said, in terms of the retina, different fractal dimensions may be able to quantify different states of this system, and so may be able to tell uh, what's normal and what's abnormal, and to quantify the degree um, that you're abnormal. Um, and sometimes when we have a fractal dimension of a certain value, we may know of a process that produces that fractal dimension. And so that may help us figure out mechanisms. For example, this shape or a branching shape is produced when growth is limited by or is proportional to the gradient of a substance as if it was diffusing. So you might think that growth of arteries, if it forms this pattern, is due to the fact that the arteries are growing proportional to the oxygen needed or proportional to the release of a growth factor. Um, and um, that's all I wanted to say on fractal dimension. So where we've, where we've come from, from today is we've seen how self-similarity and scaling can now be expressed in terms of fractal dimension. So that's the parameter that plays the role of the mean or the variance uh, in, in what the regular statistics are. Um, where we don't have moments, now we can still categorize things by the dimension. So the moments now um, don't have um, a single value. They depend on the resolution or the amount of data. And how they depend on the amount of data or the resolution is characterized by the fractal dimension. So this fractal dimension now has replaced what's important to characterize the system from the moments like the mean and variances that we were using before. And next time we'll continue with the implications of this as explicitly as possible with examples from different biological systems. So we can see the role it plays in replacing what's done in the standard analysis. And that's it. So that's a wrap.